The Abyssal Crusade was the name of a penitent crusade that was undertaken by 30 Space Marine chapters in the 37th millennium. It was first featured in the 5th edition rulebook, with more details being revealed in the 6th edition Chaos Space Marine Codex. One day, while the Imperium was just, you know, doing what the Imperium does, a massive warp storm called Warp Storm Dionys ravaged dozens of planets. Dionys, Donus, Donuts, uh, I'm gonna go for Dionys. The touch of the storm's foul energy stretched across multiple systems, causing Chaos Cults to skyrocket in activity overnight. Additionally, the Ecclesiarchy had been overwhelmed by the reports of mutations caused by the power of the Warp Storm's unprecedented shockwaves. Within the Ecclesiarchy was a man, Basilius, with vast power within the organization. Under his command were Space Marine chapters known as his Piratas divisions. After the explosion of chaos stemming from the Warp Storm, Basilius ordered that every Space Marine chapter under his command whose homeworld was affected by the Warp Storm, were to report directly to him so that the purity of their bodies could be judged. Given his overwhelming power within the chains of command, hundreds of Space Marine chapters were diverted away from actually pressing matters for Basilius' evaluations in under a year's time. While many chapters were found to be untouched by the vile energies of the Warp, 30 chapters were not as fortunate. These 30 chapters became known as the Judged, their forces corrupted by chaos to some degree. To redeem themselves, the Judged had all demanded to go on a penitent crusade to regain the Emperor's approval through holy combat. Shockingly, Basilius actually complied with their wishes, but chose the Eye of Terror as the focus of their efforts. A representative from each chapter was sent to an emergency council to discuss the particulars of the occasion, things like the agenda, the dress code, and the absolute ridiculousness of Basilius's demands. But at the end of the day, every chapter agreed to the terms. To the judged, martyrdom was a preferable alternative to a life of suspicion, or worse, falling to chaos, which would totally never happen. <laughs> at the Cadian Gate, a caravan of battle barges bravely left the section of space that was not space hell and were quickly ambushed in the section of space that is in fact 100% space hell. As the judge fought off their angry Walmart door greeters, the warp surged and cracked with energy, scattering the fleet across the entirety of the warp. Now deep within enemy territory and light years away from their comrades, each chapter was preyed upon by the forces of chaos, each one meeting a very less than ideal fate. 800 years later, the Eye of Terror spit out the remnants of the Crusade fleet, who were then promptly arrested by the Inquisition for screening. One such chapter were the Vorpal Swords, who had purged over 400 worlds of demonic influence. Their chapter master, Convac Lan, Lan? 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 immediately led his chapter to storm Basilius' palace, where he revealed that he knew his true agenda. Somewhere along the murder train, the Vorpal Swords had come into information that exposed Basilius as an agent of chaos, who sent Imperial forces into areas of chaos activity to be corrupted and bolster chaos's forces. The cat was out of the bag, and Basilius was immediately executed. As shrimple as that. A freight ship was loaded with his remains, relics, books, and thousands of still-living worshippers then immediately launched into a nearby star to cleanse it all in fire. My question was, is any, was anyone piloting the freighter? Did the pilot just die? Because like that's pretty on brand for the Imperium. Like who's gonna care about one uh, pilot? Or was he like, was he ghost riding? <laughs> was he ghost riding the heresy whip? They did say it launched, so I guess they just stuck rockets to it or something, but that's not as funny. Anyways. So was that the only outcome of the Abyssal Crusade? Well, not quite. While some chapters like the Vorpal Swords did claw their way back into real space, many other chapters met death and misery in the Eye of Terror. However, there is a list of chapters that have re-emerged from the Eye, fully corrupted by the Warp and ready to serve the Dark Gods. These chapters were declared traitors and now terrorized the Imperium under new names and new management. Today we'll be looking at the lore of five of these lucky warbands, how I went about converting them, and how to speed paint an army's worth of them. Normally in these videos I aim for a basic infantry kind of 
level of decor. And in the video where I focused on the Red Wings, which I, you should totally go check out by the way, I aimed for a lieutenant. So today we're aiming at like the sergeant slash aspiring champion levels of kit bashing, which I feel like would be a nice compromise. Low enough on the totem pole to translate to basic troops, but high enough to be expanded upon for leadership kit bashes. I think it's the best of both worlds, and I'm excited to show you guys what I made, so let's get on it. Hot dogs are an all-American fare, but most likely it was German sausage makers who first came up with the idea. The Magma Hounds were originally known as the Knights Excelsior, who found themselves on the Hellforged planet of Temporia, home of the infamously crazy warp smith, Valadrak. While investigating the planet's strange and alien construction, they were ambushed by demon engines and forced to retreat. Valadrak allowed the intruders to escape, but not before sneaking a demon on board that ate electricity, which I imagine is the warp smith equivalent of, it's just a prank bro. With their ships crashed and systems dormant, the marines were overwhelmed by chaos forces. The luckiest ones died, but many of the knights were dragged into Valadrak's hellforges to be tortured and reformed. They were now the Magma Hounds, ready to torment the planets in the Cadian system. The Magma Hounds, being an obscure warband left to the ravages of time, have no stated preference for equipment or paraphernalia, so when it came to converting this mini, I opted to go for a simple, small fur cape, which I figured would make the Legionnaire a bit more houndy at a glance, if that makes sense at all. Either way, I wanted to try a lazy method for making the fur cape. If memory serves, I've done this in the past with some cataphracty terminators, but I don't really remember. I got a post-it note and sketched and cut out a small shape that is what I can only describe as a pair of pants. I bent the ends of the uh, legs, I guess, up to match the motion of the mini and used liquid super glue to stiffen up the paper. While it's not the most durable, it was plenty sturdy enough to put on some green stuff on top and then use some clippers to pinch out a short hair texture. I took special care to cover the edges of the paper, and honestly, overall, I think it worked out. The cured green stuff gives it enough durability, so hey, if you don't feel like rolling out a sheet of putty, or don't have any like tomato paste tube uh, laying around, then this could work fine. Especially for like a bulk option, you know? The paint job was fairly straightforward, especially if you play World Eaters. Uh, the red was also described as a sangria red, which looks to be a deep, slightly purpley red. Uh, I initially used the dark red recipe that I use on my Chaos Marine army, uh, in particular their bolters, but I wasn't too sure about it until I shaded the armor with a little bit of purple wash, then it, then it looked pretty solid. Eventually I had an idea. The Magma Hounds aren't exactly dripping in lore, so I figured it'd be okay to put a little bit of a spin on them. Um, that's when I decided to try out a, like, a magma effect and make their undersuit appear to be, like, hot magma, but in a different way than I did with the Hakanor's Reavers in my other Chaos Warband video, which you should totally all go watch, by the way. I went with the plasma gun effect of the brighter yellow in the recesses and orange, red, and black on the ridges of the joints to make it look like the recesses were the brighter uh, the hotter parts of the miniature. Uh, I thought it was coming along pretty well until I realized the bolter he was carrying co covered up like 90% of my work, so I just left it as is. I, <laughs> I, I honestly kind of looked at it and went, nah, fuck it. I like the idea, but not my particular execution. Maybe a different pose, weapon, or maybe a few more layers of color to sell the magma effect, but maybe someone out there who's more inspired or better at magma to do their own magma hounds can nail the effect better than I did. As the magma hounds were killed and reborn in the fires of a hellforge, I wanted to do an industrial base. It was quickly scrapped together with some plastic offcuts and a zip tie and painted in a warm rusty color palette to you know, help really push that contrast between a warm base and a cold uh, red on the model. At some point towards the end of this whole project, like three marines in, I realized I had actually painted the pauldrons in the wrong colors, so I quickly tried to color match the gold and repainted them. Uh, I also completely forgot the heraldry, uh, a flaming hellhound skull. Um, this one was pretty complicated imagery, so I made a rough outline with a marker, 
then painted the yellow and orange of the flames on before filling out the black skull. This was mainly so I didn't have to paint yellow over black, so I can just do black over yellow, which is way easier. Overall, I think the final result is not bad, but uh, if you're doing an army's worth of this, uh, I'd definitely say get some kind of transfers or 3D like models, some pauldrons, and print them out. Maybe I can do that in the future. Um, I've done the same for the Disciples of Caliban. I made some pauldrons for them after the video that I featured them. But for now, I'll just stick with this because I'm only doing one. Um, but we'll see. I've got enough bad history with Hellhound Skulls anyways. Uh, if you know, you know. While there isn't a lot of lore for the Magma Hounds, I still kind of like them. They have a nice color scheme, pulling the red into a purple spectrum to contrast with a, like a, well, I guess a neutral gold, but like a cold or a warm gold, honestly, would look pretty good. I don't know, it's just, it's very pleasing to look at overall. It's like World Eaters, but slightly less garish. I feel like if you push the Hound motif, you might have something really unique. Maybe poach some parts from the Space Wolf bits. Uh, like, Space Wolf's 13th company is famous for utilizing bits of salvaged Chaos equipment. Uh, so people like to model them with like some Chaos bits stuck on. So it's like Space Wolves with Chaos bits. Uh, I feel like if you do Chaos with Space Wolf bits, is like the other side of the coin. And it could be a cool aesthetic for these guys to, you know, really call their own. Just some food for thought, for if you're picking like a kill team or something. But anyways, on to the next one. Words. Words the place where they keep all of the most words. Name of library. Come on, along. Once known as the Lectors of Ixus, the Oracles of Change are fanatical servants of Zinch. Their fate inside the Eye of Terror is completely unknown. The only thing known for certain is their complete devotion to the God of Change once they re-emerged from space hell. They are most known for the Battle of Valoris Quintus in the book Silver Skulls Portent, where they face off, well, you know, against the Silver Skulls. This book speculates that the Oracles of Change may be a splinter warband of the Thousand Suns. Uh, the theory directly conflicts with the concrete established lore of the 6th edition codex, but knowing the setting and, you know, Zinch, there could be some truth in it. Maybe a Thousand Suns officer integrated into the warband, or was undercover in their time while they were still the Lectors. Uh, while I will opt for the non-speculative and relevant lore of the 6th edition codex, it's really not hard to mesh these two ideas together. Speaking of meshing these ideas together, for the Oracles I wanted to incorporate some Thousand Suns bits onto the standard Legionnaire, since I have a billion Thousand Suns bits laying around, and, you know, they have some zinchi. Uh, I wanted to graft this chest plate onto the body, but the bits didn't quite match up. The Thousand Suns chest piece has a tapered waist, while the Legionnaire's body is a bit more rounded and fuller in general, got the fridge bod, leading to an incorrect fit. I was kind of committed to the idea, mainly out of curiosity, and opted to carve out the sides of the Legionnaire torso to match the new chest plate. It's a bit wonky if you're looking right at it and you know, like, you know, you're really looking for it, but since he'll be holding a bolter, I think it'll hide most of the problem. Uh, to avoid this problem down the line, if you're going to do this, uh, just use the front and the back of the rubric marine instead of grafting the front of a rubric onto the back of a standard legionnaire like I did. Just use the front and the back and then stick it on top of the uh, standard legs you won't have this problem. While the arms were box standard bolters from the Rubric Marine kit, other notable bits were this Thousand Suns head and this pauldron with Zinch's symbol on it. From the look of the plastic, it's an old bit too, and that makes me really want to use it because I like the shape. However, the helmet and pauldron were conflicting for real estate, and you couldn't really get a good pose with it, so I ended up swapping the helmet for a more accommodating head. Overall, I feel like it still looks distinctly Zinchi flavored, but not being a Thousand Suns model, you know, kind of the, the nice in-between. In general, the biggest difference is going to fall on the paint job, which we'll be getting to pretty soon. Oh, hey, that was quick. Unlike the Thousand Suns and the majority of their offspring, the Oracles of Change sport a red color scheme. 
The trim on the right pauldron and the right shin are colored gold, and the power pack arms are silver. Unlike the Magma Hounds, I opted for a warm red color scheme, which always gives me old hammer vibes for some reason. Like, in my brain, this color is Blood Angels to me. The red was highlighted with a dry brush of reddy orange, and the metals were painted accordingly. I, I then moved to the large yellow armor marking shown in the artwork. This was something I really wanted to replicate, just because it's, I don't know, it's very distinct in my brain. So I used yellow mixed with a light gray to sketch out an initial design before covering it with a pure yellow. After that, the armor was shaded with a slightly diluted brown wash, and a cool green was used to uh, pluck out the other small details, like little eyeballs and gems. The planet of Valoris Quintus is described on page uh, whatever's on screen here of the Silver Skulls novel as an industrial green and blue planet. So I opted for a beat up, slightly abandoned looking uh, metal base with a bit of overgrowth on the metal surfaces. I, uh, I like sponging on colors for these bases as not only is it quick, but it gives a little bit of texture to these flat surfaces. I'm just really becoming more fond of sponging and dry brushing marines in general. I just feel like it's a nice in-between of the clinically sterile look and the grim derp overweathering. Uh, just gives a little something for the eye to eat up. The Oracles of Change are a generally bare bones warband, but they still have an appeal to me. The Thousand Suns are so synonymous with their blue and gold coloration that I like the warbands that push it into a warmer color even if they're not uh, technically not the only ones to do this. I also like mixing rubric parts into the standard Legionnaire kit. I know the guy is a squad leader, so the fancy rubric bolter pushes him a little further than the target aesthetic, but regular bolters on the rest of a squad that looks like this would really balance it out. Overall, a pretty cool obscure warband in my books, even though if the damn ebook tried to weasel 10 bucks out of me, but hey. You disappoint me. The feeling is mutual, brother. Mother would be so proud. The Death Shadows were once known as the Lion Guard before meeting an unknown fate within the Eye of Terror. The only thing for certain is that the Death Shadows rose from their ashes, wholly dedicated to the forces of chaos undivided. The Death Shadows are mostly known for their proximity to the Ultramarines in an event known as the Sabari Slaughter, an event the Ultras were hilariously absent for. See, the Death Shadows secretly mustered their forces on the planet Sabari. Sabari? Shabari? One of those. For a surgical strike against the Ultramarines' homeworld of Ultramar. However, in the process of waiting, the shadow in the warp fell over Sabari, causing the head of the lead sorcerer to, you know. This left the Death Shadows without leadership as Tyranids descended over the planet, routing the entirety of the warband within an hour's time. Fast forward about 200 years during Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade. While the Imperium is dealing with the nightmare that would eventually see Cadia, you know, the realm of Ultramar is ambushed by a Chaos Warband known as the Bloodborne. Led by a greater demon prince and a disgruntled warpsmith, the Bloodborne is an alliance of warbands who sought revenge against the Ultramarines for various reasons. This alliance was comprised of the Skull Takers, the Apostles of Minthras, the Claws of Lorek, and... Wait, wait, hold up. Is that... is that the Death Shadows? Assumed to simply have not been on Sibari when lunch was served, the Death Shadows contributed what remained of their forces to settling the score against the Ultras. Uh, spoiler alert, no-name warbands against the Poster Boys, they didn't make it very far. The main thing that immediately caught my eye when I looked at the artwork are the robes. While the most logical thing to do for like an army-wide scale kind of thing, or I don't know, squad, uh, would be to get a box of Fallen and combine those with some chaos -y bits. However, I, I wanted a challenge. Uh, I would shave off the lumpy details of the Legionnaire underneath, like the holster and you know stuff like that, and I was going to sculpt my own robes. While sculpting robes is something I've done for a few models, I wanted to try a more dynamic cloth pose, and for this I used a 50-50 mix of green stuff and milliput. I've used this mixture for smaller tasks, 
Uh, so this is like the largest applied use I've done for it. And oh my fucking God, it's like something clicked in my fucking brain. After leaving it for an hour, it left me about 15 minutes to work with it. And everything just fell exactly where I wanted it to be and how I wanted it. The only downside is that I didn't make my sheet big enough, so I couldn't get as many folds on the back side of the model, but my god, guys, I'm still kind of riding that fucking high. I've always loved big, dynamic capes on figures and models. Yes, I love Spawn, and I feel like I'm getting closer to achieving my dream Fire Emblem cape aesthetic. Definitely something I want to practice more with, even though, as I stated, yes, a Space Marine kit with robes is 100 percent a thousand times percent more practical in almost every sense with the robe sculpted there was pretty much no other conversion work to do as the death shadows simply used generic chaos heraldry at best i moved on to their paint job their armor being a dark kind of midnighty blue and their robes and power packs just being black i opted to simply dry brush the robes and wash the armor making this the quickest paint scheme out of the bunch simply because there's no real detail work outside of what you feel like doing. You could jab some silver on some skulls and accoutrements, but seeing as my schedule is a bit cramped, I graciously accepted the easy out. I think my favorite thing about the Death Shadows is their slightly one-sided rivalry with the Ultramarines. Not only did they get ganked by Nids, but when it came time for them to invade Ultramar, they were repelled fairly easily. I don't know, it feels like having an angry chihuahua chasing your car or something. It's comical, and it'd be a bit tragic if that chihuahua wasn't trying to bite you all the damn time. While the Death Shadow aesthetic isn't pushed too hard here, I was wondering where it could go, uh, speculatively. Um, before falling to chaos, they were known as the Lion Guard, which, I don't know about you, sounds pretty close to what could be considered a Dark Angel's successor. Given how liberally the Dark Angels destroy record, there could be a familial link there to expand upon. I'm just broadly imagining a fallen army painted blue, if that makes sense. I don't know. Could be, uh, could be pretty cool. And transition. You have eyewitnesses. For instance, one case, the parents were actually saw their child summon a Dungeons and Dragons demons into his room before he killed himself. The Invocators were a Space Marine chapter known as the Clerics of Steel. A very on-the-nose name for a warrior monk clad in power armor, but then again, we don't expect subtlety in the grimdark future, now do we? Like many others on this list, the Clerics of Steel fell to an unknown fate. But when they were shat back out of space hell, they became a conglomerate of minor warbands known as the Invocators. They quickly made a name for themselves around the Eye of Terror as practitioners of demonic summoning rituals pleading to any dark god that would answer their calls and spawn them a new little, a weird little guy. Seeing as the Invocators are frequently bargaining for demonic assistance, I wanted to reflect a demonic nature on the Marine. Uh, I've always been really inspired by that one picture of a Slanesh Marine. Uh, it looks, it's just so cool and disturbing in nature, and I wanted to recreate that energy on my Invocator, uh, which yes, yes, uh, crop top. Power armor crop top. Very first step. Uh, I separated the torso and cut out the abdomen of the torso armor, uh, filling in the area with some scrap. This gave me a solid foundation to sculpt some sick abs onto the marine. With that done, I turned to a different bits box to poach for some cool bits. Nothing really in mind, just kind of going for something quote unquote broadly cool. That's when I stumbled upon this blood letter arm that when combined with a bolt pistol, gave it just enough of that demonic touch to the model that I was looking for, with a nice motion to the uh, the pose. I attached it with green stuff while also switching out the head for something more exposed. Uh, while I normally like models with helmets, both practically and in a I really fucking hate painting skin kind of sense, I wanted an exposed noggin to give more areas of the model I can paint with a pallid demon touch skin tone. Two spots on the mini felt a little low. Three spots, eh, that, that felt right. Speaking of painting, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What the fuck is this paint scheme? A red metallic blending into a blue metallic, blending into a purple metallic, then back to red? I'm not saying it's bad or anything. In fact, the strangeness makes it more endearing, but 
dear fucking lord, what, what was the artist smoking when they came up with this? I do have some problems with it though. Uh, let's compare these picks here. The one on the left is more vibrant with their colors, while this one is more muted and mostly homogenizes the blue and purple, with the red almost pushed out entirely. Furthermore, there is this example mini I found on the Lexiconum, which, n no, this, that, that fucking sucks. No, I'm not doing purple and silver. I'm using this one as my paint reference because I like the weirdness of the colors in general, uh, and it's my fucking video, my channel, and if you got a problem with it, uh, you can meet me at the flagpole and we'll fucking fight. I'm starting from a bright silver base coat and building colors on top of it with diluted contrast paints. Let me be the first one to tell you though, if you're doing more than one miniature for this warband, or if you're doing an army, just get an airbrush. It's, it's not even a suggestion, it's a threat. You'll be able to get these color gradients in a quarter of the time with transparent paints over brush blending, but seeing as one, airbrushing setup is both ghetto and ineffective, two, I'm painting one miniature, and three, I hate myself, brushwork it is. There are three spots on the model where the colors blend into the next color, so I'm very careful to focus my blending efforts there. It might take a bit, but it is doable with some patience. After the armor colors were done, I go back in and touch up the silver trim before washing it for some depth. I then paint the skin, starting with a light gray and washing it with a purple, and then the uh, very tips of the fingers get a little touch of red as well for some variation. With the mini done, I turn to the base, which yes, I know is an industrial base, but my reason was that the invocators are probably most likely spacefaring. I like to give my models a basing scheme that matches either their homeworld or current living conditions, so the Invocators also got a spaceship-esque metal base. Maybe we'll just change the name of this video to How to Stick Your Chaos Marines on Industrial Bases. The Invocators definitely win my top spot for the video's most interesting paint scheme. I'm not sure why their weird armor gradient had been slowly changed to a more pure purple over time, but the beauty of Warhammer 40,000 is that I can look at that official content and say that's fucking dumb and forget it exists. That leaves me to freely enjoy my clown shoe demon summoning nobodies in my own way. One thing I did leave out is that these metallics really benefit from a gloss varnish, although I'll probably wait till after filming to do that since a gloss varnish doesn't play well with me being filmed. Uh, we'll see what I settle on. Look around me. Look at how far and wide my secretions have spread to everywhere on this table. Next time you think you've got an innocuous runny nose, <laughs> think again. The Grey Death were once the Iron Drakes before meeting their grisly demise on the demon world of Anathrax. Stranded on the planet after the ambush fleet, the Iron Drakes found themselves on a planet covered in fungal forests and sheets of disease-ridden spores. While inhospitable to any normal life, Plague Marines of Nurgle began to skirmish with the Iron Drakes. The Plague Marines seemed to avoid killing the Loyalists, always opting to cripple or destroy their war gear. Over a hundred years they fought, the Iron Drakes slowly dwindling in strength. Eventually their ranks grew thin and the battered Loyalists surrendered, finally broken after the century of torment. They were forced into the service of Nurgle and sent out to spread the Plague Father's gifts under the new flag of the Grey Death. For this miniature, I once again dipped into my Chaos Bits box for help. Not only am I just not a huge fan of the current Plague Marine aesthetic, but I really didn't want to buy any bits, so hunting around in my box, I found some appropriate bits I could staple onto my standard Legionnaire. I really like how this kit bash turned out, actually, as it reminds me of the old Forge World Plague Marine kit that I just vastly, vastly prefer over the modern Nurgle Marines. One thing I really wanted to try on this model was texturing it after watching my friend Gino paint up an ice themed miniature on his channel. I wanted to use crackle paste, but I didn't have any, so I used layers of this crackle medium instead, some watered down snow flocking, and watered down typhus corrosion. I was really eager to get some paint on the final product, even if the crackle medium didn't crackle as much as I hoped, even with a hairdryer. There are some notable spots though, and what didn't crackle got covered with other textures anyways. To start off the painting, I primed it all with white. 
both since the base coat was going to be gray and to hopefully seal and secure the new texture I placed onto the mini. From there I opted to give the first round of shading with some diluted green wash and then do the trim with a diluted uh, black contrast paint as well. I wanted to dilute these to make sure they not only uh, flowed into all the various cracks and crevices but stayed transparent enough to hopefully keep some of that texture coming through. Then after establishing the base coats I pretty much just fucked it up you know I just did my best to try to weather it. Uh, I'm not historically a very good weatherer but I tried to do things that complemented the textures and for what it's worth I think it looks good. Uh, hopefully you guys do as well but I think this is one of my better weathering results although you know it kind of fits the Nurgle marine aesthetic you know so that was kind of the point. I don't know it's a step forward but you know I could always do a little better just more practice down the line. The base of the model was supposed to be the surface of the demon world Anathrax which has no specified description from what I could tell uh, so I opted to go with a purple base to kind of contrast with the very very light green slash gray or green tinted gray of the model. It's also a little more saturated than the model is. Um, I feel like it kind of helps contrast like you have a, a desaturated green as a, uh, sitting next to a saturated purple. I don't know it, it kind of works out. I, I don't hate it at least. Um, I'm not sure if I like it yet but I don't hate it. The main thing about Anthrax that was specified is that there's a lot of fungal spores and like this kind of gray, green gray mucus that uh, these heads essentially spit out at people. So besides from dabbing some bits of watered down Nurgle's rot and some gray contrast paint in various places, uh, I really wanted to try putting the snow texture that I had onto the mini. Like I had already used the snow texture to create some of the texture for the armor, but after all of that I still want to put some on top of that to represent the spores. I didn't leave them just straight white though, I did give them a touch of green wash, not too much though. And you know, I, uh, I think I like how it came out. Uh, it brings a little bit of the green white of the model back into prominence um, so it doesn't get too lost down in there in the weathering. It's also a nice contrasting base decoration for the purple demon world. And like yeah I've got a little pool of Nurgle's rot or two down there on the base but I don't know I didn't really have a plan so I was kind of just winging it but I kind of like the direction I winged it. Wung it? Whoa. Whoa. Regardless of the final result, this mini in particular was an experiment for me with textures. A lot of sponging, dry brushing, you know, grittiness on the surface of this mini, and I really, really like how it came out. Uh, I, I went from someone who would probably never do anything Nurgle related to, like, I could feasibly see myself with, like, a small kill team of some kind of Nurgle aligned Chaos Marines, just not the current ones with all the weird branches and horns and tentacles off of them. Like, if I could get some of the Forge World uh, little kits, then yeah, I could. I would totally, totally do like a small squad of these guys, because I really like, I don't know, just, it's it's so strange in my hand, like it's, it's a texture, I don't know, I just, I, I really like this mini. Like, out of all the uh, obscure lore I've done for uh, marine chapters and warbands so far, uh, this one's up here in terms of like, not lore, uh, but like the model. I really like it. And that's five of the judged chapters turned to Chaos Warbands in the Abyssal Crusade. I really like how this batch of minis came out, uh, with my personal favorite being the Invocator's wild ass color scheme. Uh, like I just said, I also really enjoy the texture experiments with the Grey Death. I like the kind of purpley red I got with the Magma Hounds, and I think the fur kind of looks okay. Uh, I really uh, think I'm, I've narrowed down an aesthetic for them, 
that someone else could really run with. I was super happy with my green stuff milliput experiment on the on the death shadows and while there's nothing super fancy about the oracles of change mini it's it's just solid like he looks good you know I don't know I like all five of these warbands in general and if you happen to like them you know uh, let me know if you start a force or kill team or an army of these guys uh, I have a friend who watches these videos as well hi Nathan and he was inspired to start a disciples of Caliban army after I covered them in a video and I thought that was really cool um, I've also had various people reach out and say oh hey you know I play the Punishers or you know oh I play you know I'm the one guy that plays this random chapter and I'm like oh shit hey what's up you know that's really cool so down the line if you guys ever you know make some of these obscure chapters uh on your like with your own minis you know i'm i'm on instagram just in case you guys didn't know uh you could tag me there i'd love to see them maybe at a certain point if we had enough community submissions for these obscure chapters we could do some kind of showcase in one of these videos i think they'd be really cool uh if you think i did really well uh consider giving me a tip on kofi uh never feel pressured to do so um this is uh, a hobby where sometimes you need a lot of money and I don't make a lot of money <laughs> but I do have donation uh, goals over there uh, one of them is for a big uh, project for the mythos Angelica Mortis 20 space marines fully all converted all painted up um, I think it'd be really cool and it'd be nice to hit that goal and have that uh, that big project to put out for you guys but yeah um, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video Really, I, I really do appreciate having you guys here. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.